In the 1990s, the trials and story of Eric and Lyle Menendez captivated the country. The brothers convicted of murdering their parents, Jose and Kitty. The jury recommended life in prison without parole for gunning down their parents. In recent months, new evidence has surfaced in the Menendez case that could be the key to the brothers being released with time served. And with the recent release of Gypsy Rose Blanchard, many people are calling on the early release of the brothers. Convicted of the second degree murder of her mother in 2016, the early release of Gypsy Rose was due to evidence that her mother was excessively cruel to her daughter making her a victim of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a psychological disorder in which a caretaker makes someone ill or creates the illusion of them being ill in order to receive attention or money. What do you make of the fact that Gypsy was released early after pleading guilty to second degree murder in her mother's death? It shows that the prosecutors really understood the compelling nature of her story, what she went through, and that essentially a jury would have given her at least a, a reduced sentence uh, or something that really would have been uh, commensurate with what she'd gone through as a child. Eric and Lyle Menendez claim they have new evidence to prove their parents abused them. Prosecutors charged Lyle and Eric in 1992 with killing their parents, claiming the sons wanted their parents' money to themselves so they could fund a lavish lifestyle. At trial, the brothers said they endured years of abuse, sexual, physical, and emotional, at the hands of their father and that their mother enabled it. Some of Eric and Lyle's family members testified about the abuse. The siblings said the crimes they committed were manslaughter, not murder. The first trial ended in a hung jury, the second in a conviction, and life sentences for Eric and Lyle. Now the Menendez brothers say new evidence shows they should be released from prison. Criminal defense attorney Mark Garagus, who is part of the team representing the Menendez brothers. Let me tell you what happened, at least from my standpoint. First trial was defended by Leslie Abramson. Leslie is... Uh, when I was starting out, was uh, one of the heroines in the criminal defense, a superstar uh, lawyer. She was just phenomenal to watch and in action. She tried that first case, and the half of that jury, uh, the jury hung, the mistrial was declared, but half of the jury found that uh, they did not commit a murder. And when I say they did not commit a murder, they were hung between murder and manslaughter. And the main reason for that was the abuse. There, there was front and center in the trial. It diminished the um, the notion or element of malice. So then a mistrial is declared. And guess what happens? In the interim, O.J. Simpson is acquitted. And literally days later, they go to trial, the second trial. There's a new prosecutor within the DA's office. Some, some wags said, David Kahn, who tried it, was thought to be Gil Garcetti's biggest threat for his reelection. He, so what he did in kind of a Machiavellian move is he put David Kahn on the retrial of the Menendez brothers and they were able to convince the judge to exclude all of the abuse. So not only was the second trial gamed, so to speak, by not having the ability to argue and to present evidence of the abuse, but even more unfortunate for the boys in justice was that the D. DA David made the argument in closing that it was just an excuse. They were privileged, affected uh, white kids uh, from the valley, basically, who just didn't like being grounded. Interestingly, what happened since is first, there was a letter that was written by Eric eight months before the killings took place. That letter was to his cousin. And it described it's horrific and it's attached to our filing. I think you probably read it. It'll shake you up uh, as a uh, mother. And I know it did with me as a uh, parent. Uh, you then, um, that letter uh, goes to his cousin. His cousin tragically passes away. All of his personal effects are then uh, with one of the other relatives and tucked away. Nobody ever looks through it. They then find it most recently 
The letter is, I think, devastating and shows that it was not contrived after the fact. Then what happens is you've got this NBC Peacock uh, documentary that comes out, and it turns out that there's now one of the band members from Menudo, which was a band on the RCA label that Jose Menendez was president of that label, was uh, alleges that he was molested by Jose Menendez. Now for the first time, another alleged victim of Jose Menendez is coming forward with accusations of sexual abuse, where he says Menendez drugged and raped him. That's the man here that raped me. This guy, that's the pedophile. How yeah. old are you there? 14 years old. Journalists Neri Inclan and Robert Rand made the connection between Rossello and Menendez while working on another story. Rand delivered the news to the brothers, who are currently serving life sentences without parole for their crimes. We have found somebody who we believe was abused by your father. Okay. How do you feel about that? Uh, I, frankly, uh, to be honest, sir, uh, I, I feel horrible. It's sad to know that there was another victim of my father. You know, I always hoped and believed that one day the truth about my dad would come out. But I never wished for it to come out like this, uh, as the result of, of trauma that another child has suffered. And uh, it kind of makes me very sad. I was pretty overwhelming to hear that. We heard rumors that something might have happened with Benito through the years. It's a remarkable thing that happened so many decades later. Of course, you know that that would have made a difference at trial. Certainly, that would have made an enormous difference because the entire trial centered on the belief of these events. The question really is, could this new evidence in the Menendez case be enough to get the brothers released? Now, just be forewarned that this two-part series will contain stories of extreme DV, A-B-U-S-E, and S-A against minor children. We'll be using abbreviations for these words to avoid being flagged. This case contains some of the most brutal scenarios that many of us will ever hear in our lives. You will also hear details about this case today of which you may never have heard anywhere else. With that, let's jump into part one of the case of the people versus Lyle and Eric Menendez. On the surface, the Menendez family appeared to represent the American dream. The belief that anyone, regardless of the social class they were born into, can reach their own version of success. While most people think of wealth and opportunity when they think of the American dream, still many others think of democracy, rights, liberty, and equality. But beneath the veil of prosperity and success, more and more evidence has been discovered that makes many people believe that something truly more sinister was happening in the Menendez home that would lead to one of the most brutal crime scenes in American history. We begin the Menendez story with the birth of Jose Enrique Menendez, born on May 6, 1944, to an affluent and prominent family in Havana, Cuba. In addition to being an accomplished soccer player, his father ran his own accounting firm. His mother was also a famous athlete, a swimmer who was inducted into the Cuban Sports Hall of Fame. So by all accounts, Jose and his two sisters had everything they could ever want, and it could be assumed that being born into such a successful family meant Jose's parents had a great deal of expectations for their children. However, this comfortable life was soon suddenly upended in 1959 when Fidel Castro overthrew the government and seized the property of the wealthy. Dr. Castro, the American people hope that a true democracy will emerge here in Cuba. We want to ask you about your personal plans and about what you hope for your country. Public opinion in Cuba is now very strong. Nobody is enough powerful 
op opposite now the public opinion of the free country of Cuba. So it is said that around 1960, Jose's parents sent the then 16-year-old Jose to immigrate to the United States with the fiancé of one of his sisters. After he arrived in the U.S., Jose lived in the attic of his cousin's home and attended Hazleton High School in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. It has been said that Jose really didn't have a hard time at all making new friends. In fact, he was considered to be very popular, athletic, and handsome. And people really seemed drawn to Jose, possibly even more so because of his accent. At high school, Jose joined the swim team, and it was said that Jose was one of the most competitive people anyone had ever met. Though Jose had hoped he could afford an Ivy League school, it wasn't possible with his financial status. So instead, he won an athletic scholarship for swimming and attended Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. And it was there that he met a beautiful and fascinating woman named Mary Louise Anderson, known as Kitty to those who knew her. A beautiful former beauty queen and communications major of two years his senior, Jose was very taken with everything about her. Now, Kitty was born on October 14, 1941, in Oaklawn, Illinois, into a middle-class American family. Her father had an air conditioning company, but unfortunately, Kitty had a very unhappy childhood. It was said that Kitty's father would often beat her mother, and sometimes in front of the kids, and sadly, he would also beat his own children. Kitty's father wound up abandoning the family to move in with his mistress, which completely devastated her family. It has been said that it was because of this that Kitty was really a depressed child who had very few friends. Her mother never remarried and was pretty much always bitter and depressed about the divorce. Kitty grew up believing that divorce was probably the worst thing that could ever happen in a woman's life. Kitty eventually cut all ties with her father, and as she grew older, she had dreams of having a career in producing and directing commercial radio and TV programs. So she decided to attend Southern Illinois University, and it was there that she met the dashing and driven Cuban boy named Jose. So the couple began to date, and back in the 1960s, it wasn't all too common to see an interracial couple, especially in Illinois. But the couple really hit it off, and they knew they wanted to get married. But both of their families really opposed the marriage. His because her parents were divorced, and hers because Jose was Cuban. So clearly it would appear that both of them came from these families that thought it was their place to try and control their child, even when their children were pretty much grown adults. But despite both of their family's opposition, the couple was very much in love, and they eloped in 1964. As a couple, they were really determined to pursue the American dream together and carve out amazing lives for themselves. After marrying, they moved to New York City where Jose began completing his degree in accounting at Queens College. For work, Jose washed dishes at a Manhattan restaurant at 21 years old. Jose quickly made his way up the ladder. And this would pretty much be a pattern throughout the rest of Jose's life. It was clear that Jose was the kind of person that could take control no matter what room or what business he was in. Jose soon passed his CPA exam and graduated. His first job was at the prestigious accounting firm of Cooper & Librand while Kitty was working as a grade school teacher. It was around this time that the couple got pregnant with their first child. And on January 10th, 1968, their first son, Joseph Lyle, who goes by his middle name, Lyle, was born in New York. As they were adjusting to being new parents, Kitty quit her teaching job sometime in 1969, and Jose was sent to Chicago to audit Lion Container, a client of Cooper and Librand. It was said that Jose impressed the management of this company so much that they actually asked him to come work for them as the company's controller. Now at this point, Jose was just 25 years old and really starting to do well career-wise. So he jumped at the opportunity and moved his family to Illinois where Kitty became a full-time mother. And just a year after that, Jose was actually named president of Lion Container. That's really how rapid his climb was in the company. 
However, he wasn't president for long because of a fight with the chairperson over the direction of the company. So in 1971, Jose went to work at Hertz as an executive in the car leasing division. He then moved his family back to the East Coast where they all settled in New Jersey. A short time later, the couple became pregnant with their second child. And on November 27, 1970, Eric Galen was born. Now, being that Jose came from such a successful family, he really had high expectations for his own children and family. This was a man truly driven to have his family seen as successful, and they both really wanted the best for their children. Now, Kitty and Jose believed that the heart of all success lied in a great education, so they looked into the best schools in the area and they chose the prestigious Princeton Day School, which is a private school in the wealthy Princeton, New Jersey area. Now, around this time, Kitty was home caring for the boys while Jose continued his career. Just two years after starting Hertz, Jose became Hertz CFO and continued to rise through Hertz's ranks until in 1979, when he was 35, he became Hearst Worldwide's general manager. However, although it would appear that Jose was extremely successful at Hertz, he quickly earned a reputation for being cruel and mistreating subordinates. It was really at Hertz where more and more people began to be aware of just how controlling Jose was in the work environment. Actually, because of all the friction that Jose brought into the workplace, in 1980, Jose was reassigned entirely to the entertainment division of RCA, which was the company that owned Hertz. In 1981, Jose was assigned to RCA's record division, and Jose spent much of the early 80s as the head of RCA records. He was even involved in signing bands such as Duran Duran and Menudo. Being the strong-minded man that Jose was, he was determined to improve the division by signing on bands like The Arrhythmics and Jefferson Starship. The Menendez family was now rapidly becoming extremely wealthy, and it was said that in 1980, Jose was earning about $500,000 a year, and with bonuses was earning about a million a year, which, after considering inflation, equates to about $3.7 million a year to today. So on the surface, it really appeared the Menendez family was truly living the American dream. They had a beautiful family and now they had enough money that they could really never want for anything. However, beneath the surface, things weren't exactly as they appeared. Unfortunately, much like his reputation while working at Hertz, Jose's behavior and ethics came under scrutiny once again at RCA. Aside from mistreating people, now this time it was discovered that Jose was participating in pretty questionable activities like shipping large quantities of albums to record stores in order to make sales appear larger than they actually were. It's been said that in 1986 alone, RCA was forced to honor $25 million in return albums. So there was clearly a pattern emerging that maybe Jose was a bit more overbearing and reckless than some people could live with. Several people have described Jose as not just being demanding, but as being a tyrant. And it would seem to many that he actually enjoyed being a tyrant. Many people began to wonder, if Jose was like this in the workplace, what was he like at home? It was said that the Menendez home was as strict as they come. Jose had rules for everything. What his boys could eat, whom they could spend time with, and even what they read, thought, and talked about. The boys were even quizzed at dinner about current events and ridiculed in front of others if the response was unsatisfactory by Jose's standards. Kitty remained an obedient wife alongside Jose's direction to ensure his rules were met. From the very beginning of the relationship, Kitty had always given Jose the control and freedom that he demanded. Most often, he made important decisions without consulting Kitty. And far worse, Kitty had the nagging feeling that Jose was cheating on her. She would question him and then he would gaslight her into believing that she was imagining it. However, in 1981, Kitty uncovered substantial evidence of one of Jose's relationships and she wound up leaving the family home for several days. But soon after, Jose convinced her to come back home for the sake of the boy. So it was less, you know, come home, I miss you. And it was more, you need to take care of the kids. The kids need you. 
It was at that point that Jose actually admitted to Kitty that he had acquired several mistresses. And after learning this, it was said that Kitty's mental state then began to decline. She then would fly into violent rages, even throwing things like dishes. The boys recalled that it was around this time when their mother suddenly seemed more distant and cold, even telling them that she wished they were never born. But despite her disappointment in the marriage, Kitty maintained loyal to Jose and continued to follow his direction, especially regarding the boys. She even created schedules for the boys so that every hour was accounted for. It would appear that neither Jose nor Kitty realized that they were raising children, not training soldiers. It is believed that because the boys were growing up in this extremely restrictive and unstable environment, they both kind of struggled to thrive. Both brothers had developed stutters at a young age, which can sometimes be a sign of major emotional trauma. The boys also were said to have chronic stomach pains, bad tempers, and the habit of grinding their teeth. Now, because of their parents' level of control, both boys seemed to gravitate towards each other for support, and Eric especially really looked up to his older brother Lyle, since his father was pretty much unapproachable, so he really only had Lyle to turn to as an older, protective male. Although Lyle and Eric were extremely close, their personalities were vastly different. Lyle is remembered by friends as quick-witted and standoffish, while Eric was described as highly sensitive and reserved. More signs of a traumatic home life surfaced through the boys' behavior and performance while in grade school. Both boys seemed like loners who didn't really play with other children much. When Lyle was in sixth grade, his teacher noted that he had a really hard time concentrating and his work wasn't being done. In fact, teachers had said that both boys had either learning problems or learning disabilities. However, when these issues were mentioned to Jose, he did not accept the teacher's evaluations. However, oddly after their discussions with the parents, Lyle's teacher noticed that there was suddenly a drastic change in Lyle's homework, almost as if someone else was finishing it, because there was such an enormous difference between the work he would hand in from home and the work that he actually did while in class. One teacher actually called Jose and Kitty problem parents and even claimed that Jose once accosted her in the school's parking lot about Lyle's grades. He had demanded to know why she kept giving him bad grades. Some teachers also said they had concerned about the maturity of the boys. It was said that even by the age 14, Lyle was still wetting the bed and playing with stuffed animals, which could point to some serious emotional, physical, or psychological trauma. Lyle would later remember that his stuffed toy family was his refuge. Now, Jose, coming from a line of athletes and being an athlete himself, really demanded that the boys both chose a sport to play that did not require them to be a member of a team, because Jose truly felt that teamwork would challenge his authority with the boys. So by the time Lyle was 12 and Eric was 9, they had both chosen tennis as their sport, and as the boys got older, they were really, really good at tennis. Perry Scott Berman, who gave tennis lessons to Eric while the Menendez family lived in New Jersey, said that Jose was extremely critical of the way Eric was learning tennis. He said, quote, I was teaching Eric on the far court, and Jose came running over, yelling at me that I was too easy on him. Eric was having a hard time with the lesson and I wanted to build his confidence, but he didn't agree with me. He made a comment that he didn't approve of how I was teaching his son. I didn't really see any warmth between him and his sons. He was very strict, end quote. Similarly, a former swim coach for Eric had said, quote, it seemed like Jose was so competitive he was doing everything he could to try to make Eric better. However, he was so completely overbearing, it had the opposite effect on Eric. Eric had so much less self-confidence because everything he did was never good enough. Now, by 1985, at the age of 41, Jose had risen to become the executive vice president and chief operating officer for RCA Records Worldwide. However, as hard as he tried, Jose was unable to turn RCA records around. 
He soon left RCA, and in 1986, Jose accepted a position as a corporate executive in the movie business, a company named International Video Entertainment. And this new job took the family across the country to California. Lyle was 18 at the time, and Eric was just 16. Through contacts that Jose had made while at RCA, he was able to find a position as the president of Live Entertainment in California. Live was a video distribution and duplication company and was partially owned by Carlco, a movie production company best known for producing the Rambo pictures. Jose jumped at the chance to become involved in the film business and had no problem uprooting his family and moving them from the East Coast to the West Coast, to the town of Calabasas. When the family moved, to California in 1986, Eric, 16, was enrolled as a sophomore at Calabasas High School. Finally, in a school separate than his brother, Eric's personality really began to bloom as he connected with a group of boys. The boys were an obnoxious bunch with a bit of a rebellious streak. Eric's closest friend there was a boy named Craig. Craig was the captain of the tennis team and Eric was the number one ranked player on the team. So they were like two peas in a pod and began to spend a lot of time together. Also around this time when he was in a new high school, Kitty, even more so than Jose, was pretty worried about Eric's sexual orientation. And she was so worried that she actually demanded him to get a girlfriend by the time he was 17. And Eric did, he dated a girl briefly, but apparently there's a story that that didn't end well. The couple got into such a bad fight at a party that the girl would later claim that Eric locked her into a room and would not let her leave. She claimed that she was screaming and yelling and for quite some time he wouldn't let her out until finally he did let her out. Meanwhile, Lyle, who was 19 at the time, had graduated from high school and was dreaming of skipping college and opening his own restaurant with the support of his father. However, Jose had other plans for Lyle, as he desperately wanted Lyle to attend an Ivy League school since he had never had that chance. So Lyle reluctantly applied to Princeton University in 1986. Then also around this time in 1986, Kitty made a devastating and shocking discovery. Apparently, Jose had been having an almost nine-year-long affair with a brunette businesswoman named Louise. Kitty uncovered that Louise and Jose often traveled together and even were known as a couple when they often stayed together at Louise's townhome in Manhattan. This sent Kitty into a rageful, desperate, and emotional spiral of depression, even worse than ever before. Kitty was often impatient, tearful, and extremely violent. She actually increased her alcohol and pill usage substantially at this point, and she was seeing a therapist. She even often talked about unaliving herself. Meanwhile, also around the same time, Lyle was rejected from Princeton, which caused even more turmoil in the family. Instead, he enrolled in a local community college and reapplied to Princeton in 1987 to please his father. Now, that time his application was accepted, more because of his ethnicity and ability to play tennis than really on his grades. Unfortunately, after the first semester, Lyle was put on academic probation for poor grades and was even accused of plagiarism for copying a lab partner's homework assignment and turning it in as his own. And this got Lyle suspended for a term of one year. Now, Lyle, being afraid to tell his father, he initially hid this from his father, but Jose would soon find out from his sister Terry, an aunt who Lyle had confided in. At the time, neither Jose nor Lyle really understood the seriousness of this offense with Princeton. So Jose assumed since it was just a homework assignment, he could just fly out to Princeton and have a meeting with the president and talk him out of the suspension. But Princeton's president upheld that suspension. And at that point, Lyle was absolutely humiliated and wanted to just transfer to UCLA or the University of Pennsylvania. But once again, Jose did not agree with either of those choices. Instead, Lyle flew back to California to be with the rest of the family for a while. Now, because Jose was such a successful businessman and had quickly fought his way up the corporate ladder, 
he was really looking forward to teaching his son the same strategies. So Jose decided to put Lyle to work by getting him a position at the company he was currently working at, Live Entertainment. So Lyle was responsible for reviewing expense reports and looking for ways to improve efficiency and reducing costs. But that job wound up being a dead end because Lyle would either show up late or not at all, and soon he was fired. Co-workers said that it seemed that Lyle was more interested in going to the beach than working, and he came off as self-centered and rude. But Lyle told friends that he resented working at Live because he hated watching how the work environment grew toxic when his father was around. He said he'd noticed how Jose was berating co-workers in front of others, and he really couldn't stand it. Then on June 29th, 1988, Kitty did something particularly strange. While driving along in her convertible Mercedes with Eric, she stopped at a sports store and purchased a 22 caliber gun. Confused, Eric asked his mother why she was buying a gun. Kitty replied, because I'm going to kill someone. But I remember walking toward the car and asking her what was that because she had a long box and she opened it up before she got in the trunk. And she showed you? Yes. And did you, uh, and it appeared to be what? What was in the box? It was a, uh, a wooden, partly engraved, uh, brown and black uh, gun, long rifle. And did you ask her anything about it? Yeah, I asked her, why did you buy that? And what did she say? She said, I'm going to kill somebody. Actually, she said, I'm going to kill someone. Someone. And did you uh, ask her who? No. I, I had some ideas, though. Did you ask her why? N no, I didn't ask her a single question after that. She just put it in the trunk. Well, why wouldn't you ask your mother, or why didn't you ask your mother who she was going to kill or why she had bought a gun? Because... Well, the question is, why would he or did he ask the question? So at this point, it's not hearsay. It just goes no. to a state of mind, and it's not I'll anything else. I will withdraw the question. But do you, right, you're with your mother. She's bought a gun. She says she's going to kill someone. Is that right? Yes. Is your family the kind of family where you ask each other a lot of questions, communicate a lot? No, you don't ask each other a lot of questions, especially especially with my mom, um, the way she was. Uh, she was doing a lot of strange things, and um, at the time she was really taking her medication heavily. She was taking like 13, 15 pills a day. She was disappearing a lot, and she was going into a lot of her rages often, suddenly, and I didn't... I was I was afraid of her. I mean, afraid of her outbursts and so on, and and the fact that she wasn't completely um, stable and so on. So, I I thought I knew why she bought the gun. Well, did you think she bought it to kill herself, to kill your father, to kill you? What? To kill a stranger? To kill <coughs> birds? What? I I. All right. It just uh, will reflect the witness's state of mind, and for no other reason, uh, you may answer the question: What was your state of mind? Okay, she, did, she didn't tell me why. Um, what I thought was that she was either going to kill Louise or one of my dad's other girlfriends, or she was going to kill dad. I was hoping the latter. Yeah, you were hoping the latter for your sake, for her sake? For, for my sake. sake. Now, do you remember the date of this purchase of, um, of the rifle by your mother? I know it was the summer before. I don't remember the date. Do you think it would refresh your recollection if I showed you the receipt for the purchase of the gun? Yes. First of all, Mr. Menendez, let me call your attention to the signature on the bottom of this page. Do you recognize the handwriting? Yes, it's my mom's handwriting. And do you uh, recognize this as a receipt for the purchase of a 22 caliber rifle or 22 caliber gun? Yes. And what's the date on the receipt? Can you read it? The month is in the middle. Uh, 88, uh, 62988. June 29th, 1988. Yes. And does that refresh your recollection as to when it was that you were with your mother at a store where she bought a rifle? 
Yes. Meanwhile, around this time, Eric began displaying more and more questionable behaviors. He really seemed to be getting into more mischief with his new group of friends at school. Now, sometime in the summer of 1988, Eric stumbled on a code that was for the family safe of a friend. So Eric told Lyle about it. And then in July of 1988, Eric and Lyle began burglarizing homes in Calabasas. The brothers were amazed by the large amount of cash and jewelry that they were able to easily steal. Plus, the brothers were thrilled. They found a way to avoid having to ask their father, Jose, for money. In total, the amount of money and jewelry that the brothers had stolen was estimated to be more than $100,000, an amount large enough to be classified as the felony offense of grand theft burglary. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office got a break in the case after Eric was stopped for a driving violation in Calabasas and stolen property was found in the trunk. A detective would later say that it appeared that the boys were trying to return one of the safes, but they accidentally returned it in the wrong home. So that was another way they figured out that they had actually stolen from both homes. Upon finding out about these burglaries, Jose was understandably absolutely furious, but he did not want his sons to spend any time in jail. He hired a criminal defense attorney to represent them, and the lawyer was able to work out a deal with the DA that would absolve Lyle of any participation with the burglaries if Eric took full responsibility. And since Eric was a minor, he would get lesser charges. They wound up taking a plea deal and Eric would undergo counseling. This is when Kitty found a court-ordered counselor named L. Jerome Ozeal through her own psychiatrist and Eric starts sessions. While Eric is happy to share in the sessions, he also had approved that Dr. Ozeal would share his notes with his parents. So Eric was still not given the freedom to really speak freely. He knew that his parents would be kind of listening to whatever he told the therapist. While the plan worked in that Lyle avoided charges, the Menendez family name and image was tarnished for many. The burglaries were a huge source of anger for the people of Calabasas, and the neighbors of the Menendez family were understandably uneasy now, knowing that the boys were capable of these burglaries yet did not seem remorseful at all. Not to mention that Lyle avoided charges. It appeared that Jose was blaming Eric's group of friends instead of holding his own sons accountable, just as he was telling people Princeton was to blame for Lyle's suspension. Jose eventually started to complain to his co-workers at Live that they were receiving harassing phone calls and that his tires had been slashed in the neighborhood. It's been said that fellow employees weren't really sure if Jose was just saying that as an excuse to move into a new town where no one knew the boys, but either way, he told associates that he felt that he and his family would be safer living in Beverly Hills. So in the fall of 1988, the family once again packed up their things and moved to a new town, except this time, it wasn't for a new job opportunity. It was so that people didn't know who they were. So Jose, Kitty, and Eric moved into a mansion on one of the most exclusive blocks in Beverly Hills, which was at one time occupied by celebrities like Michael Jackson and Elton John, while Lyle flew back to New Jersey to return to Princeton. While he was there in Princeton, Lyle was introduced to a student named Donovan Goudreau. Lyle and Donovan had a lot in common, and Donovan soon became Lyle's best friend. Kitty and Jose really liked Donovan because now that they were living in California, Kitty could no longer complete Lyle's homework for him, as she was doing for him for years. And they discovered that Donovan was willing to write Lyle's papers for him in an effort to kind of keep Lyle in good standing at Princeton. So it's like, once again, the parents are kind of encouraging this cheating behavior. However, despite having the offer of Donovan being able to write his papers, Lyle still really desired to transfer to UCLA. Lyle was tired of Princeton, but Jose would not entertain any thoughts of Lyle transferring to another school. 
And meanwhile, Jose was doing really great working at Live. He had recently renegotiated his contract and it was extended until December 31st of 1991. Also, in recognition of Jose's importance with the company, they invested in a key man life insurance policy that would guarantee that if Jose died, the company would continue operating without having to worry about imploding. The policy was valued at $15 million. And Live also purchased a key man personal policy for Jose's family that was valued at $5 million. Jose was to name a beneficiary as soon as he took a routine physical examination, which he was scheduled to take sometime late August of 1989, but it was expected that Jose would name Kitty as the beneficiary, which was customary under California community property laws. After Lyle returned from spring break in 1989, Donovan was accused of stealing from other students in Lyle's dorm. Instead of defending his friend Donovan, who insisted he was innocent, Lyle approached Donovan with two friends, forcing him to immediately leave Princeton. Because he rushed out of there, Donovan didn't realize he'd left his wallet with his driver's license in the room. Meanwhile, back in California, Eric was starting to attend a new school, Beverly Hills High, where he earned average grades but displayed a remarkable talent for tennis, ranking 44th in the U.S. as a junior. Meanwhile, Lyle's life was getting more and more chaotic in the early summer of 1989. Lyle's girlfriend, Christy, was pregnant. When Jose found out, he tried to intimidate her into having an abortion. And when that didn't work, Jose then paid her $100,000 to terminate the pregnancy. Additionally, Lyle's spring semester report card from Princeton was awful, despite the fact that Donovan was completing some of his work. So Lyle headed back home to Beverly Hills. And soon after, Jose and Kitty received a letter from Princeton placing Lyle on disciplinary probation after some pool tables in his residence hall were ruined during one of his parties. He had also somehow gotten his New Jersey driver's license suspended, and he and Donovan went on a golf club joyride and caused a lot of damage to the club's greens. So Jose wound up having to pay restitution to the country club for Lyle's destructive behavior. So by this point in 1989, Jose and Kitty were starting to get really absolutely fed up with their son's delinquent behavior. It seemed like every week they were doing something more and more destructive. It was a huge source of embarrassment and frustration for the couple, especially Jose, who was so used to having control over his sons so that his family and him could appear perfect. Not to mention in July of 1989, Kitty told her therapist she was afraid her sons were, quote, narcissistic, lacked consciences, and exhibited signs that they were sociopaths, end quote. Jose and Kitty were so desperate to have their sons take them seriously that they repeatedly threatened to take away the only thing they believed their sons would care about. They threatened them with money. They started threatening that they'd rewrite their wills and leave the brothers out completely. Family and friends have stated that the hatred in the family really went both ways. Kitty was heard by a friend saying out loud that the boys were disinherited, and when the friend replied, don't say that, they can hear you, they're right there, and Kitty had replied, they are aware. So the boys apparently were aware that they would not get anything. After graduating from Beverly Hills High School in 1989, Eric competed in a number of tennis tournaments during the summer. He played really well and won his first round matches. However, he lost in the second round each time. Eric has said he believed his loss made Jose so incredibly angry with Eric, so angry that he couldn't even speak, something that was extremely rare for his father who always had something to say or yell about. In fact, it was in the summer of 1989 that the extended family accompanied Eric to an important USTA national tournament in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Eric won his first round in the 18 and under single event, but in the second round, Eric started to lose. And witnesses said Jose began getting very angry and shouting commands at Eric, getting closer and closer to the fencing. Eric was playing and Jose was giving him commands of what he should do. For some unknown reason, 
Eric started losing and Jose got very, very upset and he was moving closer to the fencing and with that he was getting louder by giving his commands to Eric and the officials were called. The officials came over and told Jose that he should sit down, that he was not to be near the courts, that it was not permitted and that he was not to give any kind of directions, that he was not the coach and that he was the father and the father knew what the rules were. The rules were to sit down and be very quiet. The official left and Jose sat down for him and it got up and laughed and did not listen to what he said and proceeded to go back to the court area. Jose was then giving more directions. Eric was in such an emotional state that he turned around and told his father to shut up. And he said it very loudly and it stopped. Everybody around the whole areas, there were games going on, 15, 20 games going on. It was so loud that it shocked everybody. Jose with that then threw up his hands and just said, I'm washing my hands out of everything. I just don't want any more thing to do with him. I can't stand this. He doesn't listen to me. That's just it. Kitty, in the meantime, sitting next to me was just a nervous wreck. I mean, she had a tendency of gripping her hands and gripping her teeth to the point that she was actually white. She was also very, very, very white because by that time she had been holding her breath and everything Eric had then lost. In the meantime, Jose had just left for just a few moments and came right back, only to discover that, of course, Eric was losing. He was then very, very upset. He went into the court, and he actually was pulling Eric out of the court and just even left his bag and everything on the court. He was so upset with him. I was going to go up to Eric and say that, you know, everything was fine. He tried his best. He really did try his best. Kitty pulled me back that I was not to go up and talk to Eric at all because his father was there. Did you feel sorry for Eric? Yes, I did, extremely. He was like a little bird that lost his wings. He was very upset, and he was scared. And the fright in his face was just, I mean, you just didn't miss it. It was there. Jose pulled him off the court and pulled him right across all the other courts and took him up the stairs. Kitty went out to collect everything off of the tennis court. We then went back to the hotel. This was late afternoon, and we were then going to get ready for dinner. I had to go to Kitty and Jose's room because it then got to be very late. Kitty was in the room, but there was no Jose, and she said that he was down in Eric's room. She then said that we had to wait until Jose came out of Eric's room. We then were walking down the hallway, Kitty, myself, Brian, and Jose. We said we would like to go in and see Eric. Jose made fun of that, but as we were there in front of the room, he said, well, okay, Eric is in his room, and he will not be coming to dinner with us. So he opened the room. Who opened he, the room? Uh, Jose did. Did he have it, a key? Yes. And Eric was in bed. He looked very sad. You could tell something was wrong with him. He didn't want to speak to us. I was going to go over and give him a hug, and I was told that I shouldn't do that, that Eric just didn't want people to hug him. Now, by August of that year, Lyle had returned to Beverly Hills and was awaiting to actually transfer to UCLA. As the summer came to an end, tensions in the home really seemed to hit a boiling point. Kitty was extremely paranoid about something and began to lock her door to the bedroom every single night. She also began keeping the guns she had purchased in her closet. She also refused to give Lyle or Eric keys to the home. So when the brothers came in home late at night, Kitty would actually have to literally wake up and let them into the house. It was very clear that for whatever reason, Kitty was filled with anxiety and fear. Suddenly at the end of the summer, Eric got really upsetting news from his father. Even though he had been accepted into UCLA and was supposed to be moving into a dorm, his father suddenly told him that he would have to spend several nights a week home in Beverly Hills so that Jose could control his academic success. Now, this news upset Eric for so many reasons, but the fact that Lyle was allowed to go away for college, but he was now suddenly required to stay home some night under Jose's control made him feel like he would never have any freedom to get away from Jose. Eric has said that for years, all he could dream about was going away to college so he would have some semblance of freedom. Something he said that he really felt was the most important thing in his life. This new development from Jose confused Kitty as well, who preferred to have both boys out of the house so that 
she could be peaceful again, she could have Jose to herself again, and she could accompany him on business trips now that her boys were grown and out of the house. This news upset Eric to the point of him actually feeling like nothing mattered anymore because the one thing he was living for, his freedom, was still being taken away from him. Just a few days after that development, Eric witnessed an explosive confrontation between his mother and Lyle, where Kitty angrily tore off Lyle's hairpiece. And Eric said he was stunned because he had no idea his brother had lost that much hair. And Eric said at first he thought that Kitty actually tore Lyle's hair off. It would later come out that it was Jose demanding that Lyle kind of wear this hairpiece. And it was a huge secret to everybody else in the family. Now, after these tensions were starting to rise, Eric especially was starting to feel like something bad was about to happen, that their parents really just wanted to disinherit them and they wanted nothing to do with them. So they were a bit confused that suddenly Jose and Kitty had announced that they would take a boat trip. On August 19th, 1989, the Menendez family chartered a boat from Marina del Rey and went shark fishing. It's been said that the boys kind of stalled a bit and tried to make it so, you know, maybe their parents would go on this boating trip without them, but the parents waited for them to arrive back at the home and then they went together. And the boys kind of really felt suspicious about this trip. Eric has said that he felt even more suspicious that they really wanted to go on this boating trip, especially since the family wasn't really talking. They weren't doing well right then. So they were really both kind of puzzled why they had to go on this trip. And according to the crew of the boat, something did seem very off with the family that day. The captain said that it was just strange. In fact, they didn't seem much like a family at all. When they first got onto the boat, Kitty and Jose went below into the cabin and the boys went straight to the bow. The captain of the boat also recalled that the boys actually got pretty soaking wet and it was kind of chilly that night, but the boys did not move. They didn't try to go grab a towel or they didn't try to go somewhere else where it wasn't so windy. He just thought that was odd. Despite that it was a fishing trip as well, nobody did any fishing on this whole trip. Eric had said that his mother seemed upset that other people were on the boat. For some reason, she thought it was just going to be the captain. And then Eric wondered why it even mattered. The boys would say that they kind of felt that that trip was maybe a way to get rid of them. This kind of weird and uneasy boat trip may have been the very last warning sign that something horrific was about to happen. On the evening of August 20th, 1989, Kitty Menendez prepared two bowls of vanilla ice cream with berries in the kitchen, walked to the den, closed the door, and then sat down next to her husband, Jose, to enjoy watching TV together. What they didn't know was that in mere minutes, something truly horrendous was about to happen that would stun the entire nation. And that is all I have for today. And if you got any value out of this video, if you're interested in seeing part two, please subscribe. I would be so super grateful. Part two is going to be coming very shortly. Thank you so much for watching. Be careful out there.